Thanks, Abby. Hey, everybody. Kia ora te whanau. Happy Matariki. It is so good to be here with you. I'm like third string preacher this morning. So, you know, I mean, it's meant to be, I think it was meant to be uh, Steve, and, and, then, and then Steve had to go to Puki because, as you know, there's uh, been a real tragedy with that family uh, caught up in that horrible accident in Picton. And so the Puki family is grieving this morning. Um, so Steve made the decision as senior pastor to be out there with them this morning. So I think that's great. We're going to pray for him in just a moment. But then, of course, Bex was meant to preach, and then Bex got sick, so I'm like third, third string. So I'm like, <laughs> keep your expectations low, all right? Keep them low. But, but come on, let's take a moment and pray. Eh? Uh, the tragedy that has happened impacts all of us. You know, Paul in Corinthians talks about that, how when one part of the body celebrates, we all celebrate but also when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt as well. And this is a family that was integrally involved in that campus. And so I think it would be appropriate for us right now just to take a moment, join our hearts with theirs. Ask the blessing of God on not only the family, but the wider church family as well. Can we do that? Come on. Heavenly Father, we we thank you, Lord. And we do pray this morning for this family that has lost so much in this last week. And the ripple effect of that got into into that congregation or part of our family. We know we'll be making a deep and and terrible impact. And and we do ask you, Lord, for your grace, for your peace, for your presence, Lord. Lord, you're the one who comes into situations like this and turns them around. Lord, you give us beauty for ashes. Your promises towards us are not just for the good times, but wonderfully, they are to carry us through the worst things that happen as well. So God, we ask you to remember them and be near them this morning. Pray that you anoint Pastor Steve, Lord, as he brings a word of encouragement and comfort, Lord, to the family and to the church. We pray for wisdom and grace upon them all this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Thanks, team. Appreciate you doing that. Good for us to take a moment and do that. Well, here we are in week four of this series, going one by one through the Ten Commandments. And we are now 10, 9, 8, 7. We are on the Seventh Commandment. And it's good for us to remember that these are God's guidelines for our very best life, our very best living. You know, God took the 612, 613 laws that he gave to the nation of Israel and decided that a a top 10 would be a, a, a good idea. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you look at all the different laws that are there, all the possible guidelines that he could have given us as human beings on how to live our best lives for him in this world. And we come up with this incredible 10, and I think there's some powerful truths for us in this series that we're looking at. And today we're looking at commandment number seven, Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Now, there's a, a reason why God says that we should not commit adultery. I've seen adultery play out many, many times over my life, and it's never been a winning move. It's never worked out well. It's never ended well for anybody who gets caught up in this. Many years ago, a friend of ours committed adultery. And I think one of the sad things was is that retrospectively, we all could see the problems that were brewing in this person's life. A constant comparison, comparing her husband with other people's husbands, a constant wanting of things that she felt he couldn't provide for her, this ongoing insecurity in who she was and where God was at for them and what he had provided for her. And it was just heartbreaking. In the end, she had an affair on her husband. She got pregnant. The marriage ended. As soon as this other fella found out she was pregnant, he was gone. He ghosted her. And she spent years struggling on her own. Finally, she remarried. And we bumped into her just a few years ago. And I remember standing there chatting to her about how she was doing. And I was astonished to discover that sadly, she was still full of bitterness and blame towards other people for all the things that had happened in her life. You know, there's a reason why God says, don't commit adultery. And we see this illustrated in the scriptures many times, but none more powerfully, I think, than 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. It's a story of King David. 
Uh, King David, for the first time, doesn't go out to battle with his army. He's hanging around the palace, and he happens to see this uh, attractive woman bathing uh, in another part of the city, and instead of turning away, instead of putting it out of his mind, instead of Nessia even going and seeing his wife or one of his wives, that's a whole separate conversation, <laughs> he continues to watch. And then he finds out about her. And then he finds out that she is the wife of one of his soldiers. And instead of honoring that fact, that, that this is the wife of one of the men who right then was out there doing battle for him and for the kingdom and for the Lord, he had her brought to him. And he had sex with her. And she becomes pregnant. And what follows is a mess of deceit and lies and then murder and then involving other leaders in that murder and then taking her as his wife and then the baby dying and then his family progressively falling apart like a slow motion train wreck. It's a remarkable story. And as we learn, God sees. And if you read the story, you find that God is not gonna let David away with that even though he loves him so much. Let me read to you from 2 Samuel 12, verses 9 and 10. Why? Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. See, the consequences were massive. It impacted his family, impacted his, his, his work, if you like. It impacted his success. It impacted his future. You see, you must not commit adultery. We've got to get our heads around this. And, and the essence of it is this. You must not be unfaithful. We've got to learn to be faithful. Faithful to God, faithful to our spouse, faithful to other people's spouses. You see, here's where it applies to us. The intent of the commandment is this. The intent of it is to be a line that we do not cross. It's to be a boundary that we will not transgress. And it's important that we understand that while the commandment is stated in the negative, it's important that we focus on the intended outcome, not the unintended outcome. Let me illustrate. <laughs> this is a small town in the US, true story. And apparently it is known for the number of vehicles that crash into this particular tree on the way out of town. It's in a desert area and literally nothing grows around it for miles and miles except that there's this one ancient tree that happens to be right next to the road, the straight road that goes out of town. And it's literally extraordinary how many people apparently crash their cars into that tree. They think that psychologically it happens because people are focusing so much on not hitting the tree. <laughs> it's kind of like, don't hit the tree, don't hit the tree, don't hit the tree. Bam, they, they hit the tree. And people are so embarrassed when it happens. It's bizarre. But there's something important about this, right? Get your focus on the right thing, not the wrong thing. The intent of this is not that we go around going, I must not commit adultery, I must not commit adultery, I must not commit adultery. Like you're focusing on the wrong thing. Get your focus on the right thing. So first we need to understand the command, the line, the boundary, and why we must not cross it. And then second, we must talk about what we should focus on. So, firstly, why mustn't we commit adultery? Well, the reasons are many, but let me just touch on three today. I'm gonna to touch on a psychological reason, a social reason, and a spiritual reason. So firstly, the psychological reason today. You know, we are made for monogamy. We are made for monogamy. Now, this there's this myth out there that humans are not made for monogamy, but it's, it's completely not true from any perspective or paradigm you examine that from. You know, one of the most common human emotional experiences is heartbreak. Heartbreak. It's a psychological, emotional, and physiological response to the breakdown in a monogamous relationship. And it doesn't matter if you're 16 or if you're 60. When that sort of breakdown happens and something you consider to be a monogamous relationship, there is an internal physiological breaking that happens in us. We are made for monogamy. If the opposite were true, that would not happen. 
Look, even from an evolutionary perspective, if you subscribe to that, we are clearly made for monogamy. The human infant is unique. It takes so long to mature to independence. For some of us, like 40 years. <laughs> it takes so long that it, de- it demands intense and prolonged input for literally years and years. Now, look, take an infant antelope, for example. I'm sure you've all watched The Blue Planet or some of those great nature documentaries. And we've seen the antelope out there on the savannah and a baby is born. Bam, hits the ground. And 15 minutes later, that thing is walking. 15 minutes. They say that it just takes 14 days before that little baby antelope is not just walking, but running fast enough to keep up with the herd when it's moving, and those herds move it up to 40 kilometers an hour. That's extraordinary. Took me over a year to walk. (laughs) And I'll be honest, I've seen the videos. I was terrible at it. (laughs) You know, I've seen seriously drunk people walk better than how I was when I first walked. There was no keeping up with no herd there, I tell you. It was... And I can't even talk about learning to eat. I still can't run at 40 kilometers an hour. The point is this, is that the human infant needs years and years of very intense protection and input in order to become independent. And the best way, simply, clearly, logically, reasonably, is to have a couple of adults that are there and able to work with that infant for a long period of time. Do I hear an amen from any parents here this morning? Adultery, which then disrupts that pairing, causes great psychological pain and distress. It impacts the self-image and identity of the people involved. Relationships spawned in adultery rarely last, and the result is always pain and distress and dysfunction and ongoing problems that come from the breakdown of trust. That's why God says, do not commit adultery. But there's also a social reason. Human communities throughout history have been built on interconnected, family units. Now, when adultery happens, it breaks one of those family units, but it doesn't end there. There is a ripple effect that goes out through family, through relationships, through interconnected relationships. And this touches on the second myth, that adultery doesn't really hurt anyone. Oh my gosh, complete rubbish. Adultery wrecks families, separates friendships, impacts communities. You know that story I told you right at, that, right at the start about this, this person that I knew? You know, one of the saddest things about that was how it impacted a whole series of friendships that were around that couple. I remember being at a mate's place, and he was a guy I had huge respect for. He was kind of like a mentor to me in some ways. But he didn't like where I was at with this whole thing. And he was deeply entrenched in his position on who was to blame and what it was. And man, I'm just trying to be gracious and I'm just trying to, you know, be fair about things. But in the end, that friendship too was completely ruined. I think it was the last conversation I ever had with him. That breaks my heart. I tried reaching out to him a few years ago. He's just not interested. You see, there's a social reason why God says, do not commit adultery. And then thirdly, there is a spiritual reason. You know, when two human beings come together, we must remember that at the core, we are spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings. And when two spiritual beings come together in the covenant of marriage, there's something spiritual that happens that Jesus describes as follows in Matthew 19. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female, and he said, for this reason, A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Listen, therefore, what God has joined, let no one separate. You know, in in some ancient Jewish marriage ceremonies, when a couple were married, as part of the ceremony, they'd actually place a wooden yoke across the two of them. Or in some cases, they would drape chains over their joined hands to signify the exclusive binding committed union that they were entering into. And there's something spiritual that happens in that. As Jesus said, what God has joined together, God does something. There is a divine connecting 
that happens when two people come together. And this leads us to the third myth about adultery, that it's just sex. Can we be clear? It's never just sex. You see, to break this spiritual union apart through unfaithfulness is to bring a rupture spiritually deep within a person's spirit and to undo the work of God in two people's lives. It's taking two bits of paper and gluing them together and then trying to separate them, you always end up tearing both pieces of paper. It is a serious matter. Canon J. John says, it destroys families, it defiles marriage, and it defies God. And so when God says, you must not commit adultery, it's because the one who created us He knows how destructive this is in comprehensive ways. He knows that we are not made for it. Look, if you've ever come across the instruction manual for a toaster or a hairdryer, it's great, a hairdryer. You know, one of the things it says on it, it says, keep away from water. Keep away from water. Why is that? I'm sure we've all seen the movies where, you know, someone's, this is not a good illustration, Um, but... (laughs) The point being, you know, if, you, if a toaster gets in water or a hairdryer gets in water that you're also in, that causes a great deal of pain and destruction, both to the hairdryer and to you. Likewise, when the instruction manual says, keep away from adultery, it's because when we engage in adultery, it causes pain and destruction to both parties and multiple parties that are involved as well as you. And we've got to take God at his word. That's what we do as Christ followers We begin by taking God at his word. Jesus says this. You have heard it said that you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look at a woman or man lustfully, you have committed adultery with them in your heart. Now, this is important. This is important because not only does it take us to the the heart of the matter, the root of the issue, but it also alerts us to the process. Do you notice that? It starts with a look, then a thought, then an action. And that means that if we are going to learn to walk without having adultery in our lives, we have to learn to kill it at the look. Does that make sense? I heard the story, again, Canon J. John tells the story of a couple in a cafe sitting there having a coffee uh, when an attractive woman walked in and as she walked past the couple, the man's eyes followed her. Without even looking up, the wife stated, I hope that was worth the trouble that you are now in. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to address this process just a little bit more because, because in the book of James, chapter one, James tells us that temptation isn't sin. In Hebrews, we find that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet was without sin, right? So temptation itself isn't sin. The look itself is not sin. We walk around, most of us, with our eyes open, although I've been on the Auckland motorway sometimes, and I'm not sure if everyone has their eyes open. (laughs) But we walk around, we're gonna see things, but... What James so clearly illustrates and teaches us is that it's what we do with that thought that lets sin in. It's not a sin to notice someone who is attractive to you for whatever reason, but to indulge in that thought is a sin. And if you haven't dealt with that look in the first second or so, well, you're starting to get into trouble. That's the truth. And that is why porn is so dangerous because it builds a habit of taking a a look straight into a sinful thought. It builds a habit of taking a look straight into a sinful thought. Porn is adultery, firstly. Secondly, it trains the mind to go straight to adultery. You must eradicate porn if you have porn in your life. It is unbelievably destructive. And let me just add to that. For every person out there who has overcome it, or who is currently battling with it, I honor you because battling is sometimes what we've got to do. You know, Paul talks about in your struggle against sin, we're not always going to win everything. 
We're not always going to win everything all the time, but God calls us to be strugglers. He calls us to be battlers. And I want to say to you, if you're battling with that issue right now in your life, I honor you. Keep battling. Stay the course. Get the help that you need. You can win it. Okay. Let's turn this now onto the positive. So what do we focus on, right? Focus on faithfulness. Now let me unpack this. See, the prophet Malachi warns the people of Israel against being faithless in their marriages, not loving their spouses, but effectively hating them, not protecting them, not watching out for them. The implication is clear. God expects us, above all things, to be faithful. There is nothing more impressive than faithfulness when we see it in action. Many of us here have been to see romantic movies, some of us by choice and some of us (laughs) out of obedience. Um, But I remember seeing the movie The Notebook, The Notebook by Nicholas Sparks. It's a bit of an old classic now. But if you've seen the movie, like many romantic movies, it's easy to get caught up in the love and the passion. Yet if we look more closely, What it is that actually moves us the most is the faithfulness, the commitment. You see, that movie at the end is about a husband whose wife has dementia and who turns up every day to this wife who doesn't remember him. But as she was going into dementia, she wrote a notebook of their love story that she might somehow, maybe in some way, remember him, remember what they had, and he turns up every day to a wife who doesn't remember him and reads the notebook to her, tells the story of their love and the hope that they might have another few moments together. That commitment, come hell or high water, that is what heroes are made of. That is what true love is about. That is what truly moves us. Don't commit adultery. Commit to faithfulness. You know, faithfulness is one of the most powerful aspects of who God is. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, it says, Now, therefore, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Faithfulness is a mark of God's character. It occurs over 110 times in the scriptures. It was prophesied about Jesus that he would be the faithful servant. Moses was described in the scriptures as being faithful. The apostles were commended for faithfulness. The church elders were ordered to demonstrate it. The churches were instructed to manifest it. God is looking for people of faithfulness. Psalm 4 verse 3, know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be faithful. Be that man. Be that woman. You know, I remember when Liz and I were newly married, uh, and Liz was still a travel agent. And so uh, in our first year of marriage, she was still traveling around the world and doing a bunch of things. And on this particular trip, she was on a work trip to Las Vegas. (laughs) I know. I've been on like a work trip to Hamilton. It's not quite the same. You know, she was on a, a work trip to Las Vegas, and, and as they flew into L.A., because Liz is a sanguine personality, she chats to everyone, she ended up chatting to the, the stewardesses and, and the steward, and then this male steward began to hit on her. And, uh, and he's like, hey, well, w- when we land, come out for a drink. You know, I'll show you a good time. And he's, he's kind of doing these things. And, um, but but Liz, was, Liz knows who she is, right? She blew him off, and then as soon as she got to a hotel, she rang me up, and we had a good giggle about it. Because we're faithful. We're not seduced by the attractiveness of random things like that. We made a call. We know the kind of people that we want to be. So then how do I be faithful? You know, faithful, the word at its simplest means to be faithful. To be full of faith. To be faith-filled. And so to be a faithful man or woman is actually all about faith. You've got to have faith. And faith in a number of things, not just faith in God, but you've got to have faith that your spouse is the right one for you. That is important. Because you know what? We, we, one of the things that happens when we live with someone 24-7 is we don't just see them at their very best. 
we also see them at their very worst. Just remember, they see the same about you. (laughs) Faith that your spouse is the right one for you. You don't have to look anywhere else. You trust God with that or not. Secondly, faith that you are the right one for your spouse. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for us and to, at times to go, I'm ruining this person's life. What am I doing here? And when we make mistakes and we go through a bad season, when things aren't going well, it's, it's not uncommon to do that. But you've got to believe you're the right person for them as well. So tap into your best self. What are the gifts that God put in you and how can you bring that to them every day? God has called you to light that other person up, to be like him for them. Thirdly, faith that there is a way through every issue you might face. Because I tell you, God is far more interested in your marriage even than you are. And lastly, faith that your relationship can be great, that you can have great love, that you can have great sex, that you can have great companionship, that you can have a great future together. Faith that God's intent is that your marriage be blessed in every way. Can you believe that today? If we can get the team up now, that'd be great. We're gonna come to a close. You know, to commit adultery is to be faithless. And that is not who we are, amen? You have to have no faith in any of those things if you're gonna go down that road. But God has called us to walk by faith, to live by faith, and to love by faith. And yes, there's a line we must not cross There's a place we must not go. So let's not commit adultery. Let's commit faithfulness day in and day out. You see, faithfulness is powerful. Faithfulness is admirable. Faithfulness takes courage. It takes discipline, but it also brings freedom. It brings joy. It brings satisfaction. It builds deep, lasting, affair-proof marriages and it builds families that God is looking to bless. Can I say this to you today? If you are committing adultery, you need to stop. You need to end it. You need to return to faithfulness. And have faith again. Trust God with your future. Come on. You know, can I say this? For those people who aren't married, perhaps, if you're in a sexual relationship and you're not married, you've got to realize you're not in faith. Trust God that if you do it His way, He will bless you in every way, in ways that you cannot imagine. You need to turn that around. Secondly, can I say this? If you're caught up in porn, you need to get help. You need to break that habit. You've got to find a way out of that addiction. And there are great resources and there are great people out there who have success in helping people break free from that. Fight the good fight. See, fighting against pornography is fighting for faithfulness. So if that's you, hang in there. Don't despair. Keep going. Win that battle. We believe for breakthrough together. And then thirdly, you know, if you've committed adultery in the past, and actually there's guilt and shame that still follows you, I want you to hear the words of Jesus spoken to someone caught in adultery. He said, I don't condemn you. Go. Leave your life of sin. I love that. No condemnation. Just turn it around. Learn the lesson. Get some help if you need it. See a pastor, a counselor, work through it, but receive your forgiveness. God is not hammering you. He is just waiting for you to get back on your feet. Get back doing what he's called you to do. Jesus is the healer. What is torn can be restored. Come on. Let's commit afresh to faithfulness today. Amen. Can we pray? Mighty God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your word, God, that so richly encourages us. God, may we be men and women faithful, God, in our relationships. God, set us free from what the devil would love to bring destruction to our lives with. God, fill us with faith. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Before we go today,
can I say to you, get it here and online. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never actually taken that step of putting your faith in Him, taking that step of going, all right, God, let's do this. Man, my way's not working. Uh, that was, that's my story. My story was 22 years and then realizing my way's not working. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't say for God so loved the Christians. For God so loved the world. God loves you and He wants you to know Him and experience His love and His plan in your life. But the Bible tells us in Romans 3 that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We've all fallen short of God's standard. Man, I have. But that's why Jesus came. God sent His Son that He might die in our place, that, that, that payment might be made for everything that I've done, everything that I've done, everything that you've done, and that through faith in Him, we might be forgiven, made clean, given a new start. John chapter one, it says to all those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. When you receive Jesus, when you make him God and Lord of your life, you can for the first time know forgiveness. You can know what it is to have a fresh start and you can know what it is to know him and experience his plan in your life. And I'm telling you from experience, it's the best plan. Is today your day to come home is today your moment to get right with God? Do you need a, a fresh start? Do you need a second, a second chance? If that's you, why don't you bow your head and pray this with me? Can we all bow our heads? And maybe in your homes, you can bow your heads as well. I wanna lead you in just a simple prayer, just a, a conversation between you and God, but it's a repositioning of yourself. If that's you today, why don't you pray this with me? Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I admit that I am a sinner, that I've rejected you and your way in my life. But I believe Jesus came for me. And I believe that I can be forgiven because of what Jesus did on that cross. And so Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me now in Jesus' name. I commit myself to you. Holy Spirit, would you come and fill my heart and fill my life and make it new. I choose this day to make you the Lord of my life. Jesus, thank you for your promise that if I receive you, you will make me yours. Do that right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, I'm gonna ask you to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed just for one more moment. You know, the Bible says that, that there's actually like this huge celebration that breaks out in heaven when one person makes that decision, when one person turns around and says, God, I want you. We wanna not just celebrate that, but I wanna pray for you if you prayed that prayer this morning. And, and so online, if that's you, you can click that button says, yeah, I made that commitment today. I'd love you to do that right now. And if you're here in person and you made that decision with every head bowed and eye closed, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to slip your hand up and, and just indicate to me that, yeah, you prayed that prayer because I'm gonna pray and I'd love to know who I'm including in that prayer this morning. It would mean the world to us. So if that's you, if you prayed that prayer this morning, if you took that step of faith right now, would you slip your hand up, give me a wave. Just as I'm looking across the auditorium, Anybody here just say, yeah, that was me. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else here today prayed that? Just give me a wave. Say, yeah, that was me, Mike. Put your hand back down. God bless you. Wonderful. Amazing. So good. Okay, let me just pray. Mighty God, I thank you, Lord, for every decision, God, that was made here in this room, God, and across people's homes that are watching online. Mighty God, I thank you, Lord, for new life, for God, a new beginning that is happening right now. God, I thank you for the celebration that is occurring in the unseen right now, God. And I thank you, Lord, that everything has changed for those people. God, we ask your blessing upon them, surround them with your angels, God, surprise them with your goodness. We ask in Jesus' name.